Hello, thank you so much for clicking this button and allowing us to come into your spaces. Whatever you're doing right now, I just pray this message will be a blessing and uplifting and life-giving to you. Uh, please go to our church's website to check out what's going on. You are part of the family, and I want to invite you to get connected to all the things and groups and events that are going on so you can join this part of our spiritual journey as well. And make sure to like and subscribe whatever platform you're watching so you can continue to receive these videos on your feet. So here's the message. Enjoy. Welcome to all of you and to those who are joining us online from literally around the world, uh, which is so cool. We have people engaging from all around the world. And uh, so welcome to all of you. We are in week three of a very significant journey the journey of intimacy with Jesus. We're taking a break from our First Corinthians series to focus for eight weeks on this question of how we can grow in our relationship with Jesus. And what we're learning is that deepening intimacy with Jesus is something that we can actually cultivate in our lives. There are five core spiritual practices that all of us can engage in that will help foster a more intimate relationship with Jesus. And so in this series, we're not only learning about what these core, these five core practices are, we're actually doing them. We're doing the stuff, okay? We're doing them. So each week, I'm presenting content in my message. This content is also contained in a book that I've written called The Intimate God. We do finally have copies available. Um, so we have plenty of copies available for $10, or you can order it for a little more on Amazon. There's also a Kindle version and an Audible version. But in addition to that content, each week, there are three exercises that we encourage you to do that week as a tangible way to put into practice what we talked about, as a tangible way to incorporate the content into our lives. Because look, friends, information alone will not transform us, even though we kind of, especially in the American church, we tend to think that more and more information, information alone will not transform us. What will transform us is when we actually put that information into practice, we do it. So the exercises are available in the book. They're available in the QR code link, or they're also available in printed form at the information area. So we began this journey two weeks ago, laying a crucial, absolutely crucial foundation for intimacy with Jesus. And that is us living in the reality of God's absolute delight in us. And then we did exercises to reinforce that. That was week one. Then last week, week two, we learned the first of these five core spiritual practices, the practice of stillness creating space in our lives in order to be present to our true selves, where our heart is really at, in order to then be present to Jesus. So this past week, we did three exercises that put that practice, put that into practice, beginning to build into our lives this experience, this rhythm of stillness. And I am so encouraged by the stories I'm hearing from people of, who are leaning into this practice of stillness, including stories from our children's ministry, our student ministries. I had a couple of parents tell me how their child, their kids, you know, CC kids age child, how their child last Sunday afternoon, after the sermon, after they experienced that in CC kids and all that, they told them later that afternoon they were going to go practice some stillness. And I thought that is really cool. I mean, I mean stillness, seriously, stillness can be such a powerful, antidote to the, to the pressure and the anxiety of our society today. And so I'm so, so excited that people and even children in our church were practicing this because it can be so life-changing. The practice of stillness is so life-changing. Because of that, we're going to spend this week learning, le leaning more into this particular aspect, uh, uh, the, the practice of stillness, into a particular aspect of this, and that is listening to Jesus. See, part of the purpose of the practice of stillness and being present to our own heart 
is that that creates space in our lives to better hear the voice of Jesus, which is a crucial aspect of intimacy with him. Check out what Jesus told his disciples in the night before his crucifixion in John 15. Look at this. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends For everything I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. This is fascinating. Notice Jesus is inviting us into a relationship with him that is more than simply being his employee or his servant. He's inviting us into a relationship of friendship, of intimacy. So according to Jesus, what is it that makes the difference between being a servant of Jesus or being his friend? It's our willingness and our ability to hear all that he wants to disclose to us. Our ability to hear the voice of Jesus is a crucial aspect in our experience of friendship, of intimacy with Jesus. So this week, in the message and in the exercises, we're going to be learning how to better listen to the voice of Jesus. Now, by the way, this is something that believers in Jesus have cultivated for centuries. So we're not talking about anything new. This is where we're in good company in terms of all that we're talking about here. Now, one of our guides in our journey in this process is going to be the prophet Elijah, whom we looked at last week. So after a significant spiritual journey, Elijah... He uh, ticked off King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, and she threatened to kill him. And so Elijah fled for his life and he went to a a wilderness where he could be by himself. He was creating space for stillness. We talked about this last week. And in that space, he began to just be present to his own heart, which again, we talked about last week. Elijah poured out his heart to God, acknowledging his own feelings of worthlessness, of frustration, of despair, all that stuff. Well, in that place of brutal honesty, in that place of Elijah being present to his heart, something really powerful happened to him. He heard the voice of God. See, his ability to be present to himself and authentically acknowledge where he was at, that enabled him to then hear God speak into his situation. But what I want us to focus on is how he heard God's voice. This is so important. As Elijah is standing outside the cave that he was in, this is what happened. 1 Kings 19. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The Lord was in the whisper. See, Elijah's experience of stillness opened the door for him to better hear the Lord's voice. See, I wonder if part of our struggle to hear God's voice is because our souls are rarely quiet enough to hear his whisper. I mean, if God spoke to us by shouting, we wouldn't need stillness, right? If someone is shouting at you, their voice is nearly impossible to ignore. But what if they're whispering? What if they're whispering? You have to lean in to hear them. See, maybe that's why God's primary mode of communication with us is through a whisper, He he, he wants us to slow down and lean in. In Psalm 46, the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. Notice the order. Be still and you'll know that I'm God. The knowing God comes after the stillness. Okay, so how can we better hear the whisper of Jesus. Well, the good news is this is something we all can grow in. There are, there are three, these are things that we can, we can improve on, right? There are things we can do to improve on our ability to listen. Actually, I'm going to simplify it because it's not, I mean, there are a bunch of ways. Yeah, we could be better listeners, but I'm going to simplify it. There really is just one crucial element to effective listening. 
in any relationship, in any relationship, including our relationship with God. Attentiveness, attentiveness, that's it. If you want to improve your relationships at work or your marriage, your family, your your friendships, learn to be an attentive listener. And if you want to grow in how to hear the voice of Jesus, the same thing applies. We must learn how to be attentive. Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. My sheep listen to my voice. How many of us realize there's a huge difference between hearing and listening? Just because sound waves are entering my ear canal doesn't mean that I'm actually listening. I remember a conversation with Raylene where I was looking right, I was looking at her, I was nodding my head, she was speaking, and finally after a couple of minutes she said, where are you? Where are you? You're not listening. And she was absolutely right. I was hearing the sound of her words, but my mind was thinking about something at work. See, listening requires attentiveness. It requires attentiveness. Choosing to focus our complete attention on the other person. And this is especially true in our relationship with God because God isn't usually speaking audibly. I have never heard his audible voice. God is spirit. And the the way he primarily communicates with us is to our spirit. He whispers to our inner being, which takes this idea of attentiveness to a whole new level. See, for years, even as a pastor, I didn't think God was speaking to me. Even though I was teaching this stuff, I didn't think he was speaking to me. For some reason, I just felt like I couldn't hear his voice, and I, I, he, he wasn't speaking. I, I was in so he was choosing not to include me because everyone else talked about hearing his voice. I, I just couldn't, and I didn't know what was up. It was very frustrating, especially as a pastor. I was, should be able to do this. And so for a long time, I felt like a, a kind of a second class Christian that I was missing out on something. And so in the midst of this journey, it was a number of years, but in the midst of this journey, I had this. I finally had this really significant realization that God actually was speaking to me. My problem was that I was expecting him to shout. That's what I was expecting. I was expecting him to shout. I was expecting some unmistakable form of communication, an audible voice, a lightning bolt, you know, from heaven, an HD quality vision, like a television set that I couldn't possibly ignore. But he was whispering. He was all that time. He was whispering. And the the thing that we all know about a whisper is that it can easily be ignored. It can easily be ignored. So it was when I cultivated, began to cultivate an an attentiveness, I realized, oh, he's whispering. So when I began to cultivate an attentiveness to his whisper, I began to better hear his voice. Okay, so what does it mean, practically speaking, to hear the Spirit's whisper? Well, we're talking about something that happens internally in our spirit. The way the Holy Spirit most often speaks is by dropping into our heart or our mind a thought or an idea or a prompting or a scripture or a picture or a song lyric or a phrase. And it may initially feel like a fleeting thought, something that we could easily ignore and we probably have ignored it hundreds of times before, but now because we're being attentive, we choose not to ignore it. We pay attention to it. We realize, hey, this could be the Lord whispering to our heart. About a year ago, I was praying for one of our adult children, bringing to the Lord a specific request that for years I'd been asking him for. And as I began to pray for this again, I Out of the blue, kind of, I sensed a gentle whisper in my spirit, a thought. Again, it sort of came from out of the blue. And this is what I sensed. I want you to stop praying about this. I've got this. And I knew this thought wasn't from me because I wanted to pray for this. Uh, You know, I wanted this to happen. So I decided to pay attention to the whisper. And I stopped praying about that. And wouldn't you know, just a few weeks later, God specifically answered that request that I had been praying earnestly about for years. 
See, God doesn't necessarily always want us banging on the door of heaven with our requests. Sometimes I think he just wants us to listen to his voice and let him lead our praying. Stillness gives us time to do that. It gives us time to listen. So in my own journey of listening to the voice of Jesus, I've discovered something simple and yet incredibly significant. God most often speaks to us through our own thoughts. In other words, he doesn't speak to me in Shakespearean language. He speaks to me the way Alan Craft would say it or hear it. And I love that because it is personal and it is real. His spirit and my spirit. His mind and my mind in the same place because I have chosen to quiet my heart and listen. Again, I wonder if sometimes we're missing the Lord's voice because we expect it to sound way different than our own thoughts. When in reality, he most often speaks to us through our own thoughts. We just have to learn how to pay attention to those thoughts. Do you see why the practice of stillness is so vital and so important in our cultivating intimacy with Jesus? Stillness enables us to quiet our hearts and our minds so that we can be more attentive to his whisper, so that we can actually hear the things he's wanting us to know. Okay, so let's get even more practical. How can we grow in hearing Jesus' voice? And one thing that I've discovered in my own journey is that my ability to hear the Lord's voice increased dramatically when I began incorporating a fairly simple practice into my times of stillness, asking questions. See, what better way to grow in any relationship than to ask a person questions. Questions are a simple but powerful way to gain access to someone's heart, right? It's a way to get closer to someone. You're asking questions, you gain access to their heart. So by asking God, quest, asking God questions, we actually gain access to what is on his heart. So it's no wonder that this can have such a powerful impact on our experience of intimacy with Jesus. The practice of stillness creates space for us to ask the Lord questions and then to tune in to his whisper. So what kinds of questions should we ask him? Ask him anything. <laughs> Seriously, ask him whatever is on your heart. As, as we saw in last week's content, the, the practice of stillness helps us tune in to what is really going on in our mind and our heart. What, what are we feeling? What, what, what are we worried about? Well, once we tune into that, why not ask Jesus about that? Why not ask him about those parts of us and then listen? I do this all the time. I, for instance, anger. I sometimes struggle with, with anger when things don't go the way that I think they should, because um, I think I should know what's best, right? Uh, anyway, but now, now earlier in my in my you know years being a Christian for a long time, I was basically taught that anger is bad, and so I just need to resist it. I need to fight against it, which sounds great, but it really didn't help uh, me in the moment that my anger was ignited. See, it, it was through the practice of stillness that I began to realize there's a there's a Another way to approach this, what if I acknowledged my anger and I moved towards it with Jesus? What, what if I invited Jesus into this place? What if we actually asked Jesus about my anger? Jesus, why did I get so angry in that meeting yesterday? What was going on? And then we let him speak to us about our anger. And let him minister to that part of us that's, that was fueling the anger, which is usually fear. Almost always our anger is fueled by fear. So what, what happens is that we begin to experience Jesus' compassion and his love, which actually helps dispel the underlying cause of our anger or our anxiety or whatever it happens to be. This is why last week I emphasized so much this idea of when we practice stillness, of starting our stillness by being present to ourselves. 
I use the analogy of a table. What parts of me are around the table right now? Are there any parts of me that Jesus would want to speak into? I got some anxiety going on. I got some anger. Are the, you know, what would it look like to invite Jesus to speak to that part, to the anxiety I'm feeling or the anger I'm feeling or whatever? In Isaiah 9, Isaiah prophetically describes what Jesus will be like. This is always connected with me, especially more recently, the practice of stillness. Look at this, Isaiah 9, 6, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. See, in stillness, we can experience Jesus in this way, as one who counsels us in the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of our anger, in the midst of our discouragement. The key, though, is is, is being willing to ask the Lord about certain parts of us that are around our table, certain parts of us that are needing attention. And then once we ask the Lord about it, hey, what's this about? Once we ask the Lord about that, the key then is paying attention to the thoughts, the words, the impressions, the pictures, the scriptures that immediately come to your mind and your heart after you ask. So what I like to do, I like to have a journal available. When I'm asking the Lord a specific question, I like to have a journal available as, and it's just to write in as I'm hearing. And then I can, I just write whatever I'm hearing. Then I can later go back and evaluate. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But my initial goal when I'm asking the Lord a question is just to tune into the thoughts and then just start writing to kind of get the flow going. And then I can evaluate it later. A second situation in which asking the Lord a question is so helpful is when you're praying for someone else, you're spending time praying for someone else. So often we, we jump into our prayer, okay, I gotta pray, here's my list, I'm gonna pray for my husband, my, my spouse, I'm gonna pray for my daughter, whatever. You're praying for these things. So often we just jump in and we just start praying for these people. What if we actually stopped before we prayed for this friend or this person? What if we stopped and said, hey, Jesus, what do you want me to pray for this person? What, what is on your heart for this person? And then you just listen. What does God bring to mind? Maybe it will be something you hadn't even thought about praying for. I mean, this is something that you'll be practicing this week in one of your exercises. You're going to be asking God what he wants you to pray for, for someone else. Another area in which we can ask God a question is when we need guidance. We see a powerful example of this in, in um, uh, Mark chapter one, um, in, uh, in the life of Jesus. We saw last week how after a really demanding day of ministry, Jesus got up early, he created space for stillness. He went to a solitary place to pray. We looked at that last week and we're gonna talk more about prayer next week. But, but as he's in this place of stillness, And prayer, his disciples come and they find him. And they say to him, everyone is looking for you. In other words, why are you wasting your time praying here? There are a lot of things that need to be done to help these people. And notice Jesus' response. This is fascinating. He had just spent time in stillness, listening to his father's voice. And here's what he says. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. See, clearly in his time of stillness with his heavenly father, Jesus received guidance and direction for that day's ministry. Rather than simply being driven by need, Jesus was led by God. Think about that. Need doesn't always just, you know, mean God's leading us somewhere. Rather than being, he wasn't just driven by need or he would have stayed there because there were plenty of needs around. He was driven, he was led by God. And stillness is what enabled him to experience this. It's what enabled him to receive this direction. About a year ago, I was needing to decide, um, making a decision, made a need to make a decision regarding a a denominational leadership team that I'd been a part of for a number of years. And I was really losing my motivation to be a part of this group. I wasn't sure I should continue. And I knew I needed to decide, but I just kind of kept, you know, I kept kicking the can down the road. You ever done that with a decision? You just, they just, oh, I'll just, whatever. You didn't, I didn't really think about it much. And so I'm just kicking the can down the road, basically. One day I'm, I'm, sharing with Raylene, I don't know what to do about this group. And, and uh, she immediately asked me, have you asked Jesus about that? Have you asked Jesus what he wants you to do? And I couldn't believe she would even ask me. I'm a pastor. I mean, come on. Of course I'd asked Jesus. And then I realized I haven't 
actually ask Jesus that question. So the next morning in my practice of stillness, I took out my journal and I wrote at the top of the page, Jesus, what do you want me to do about this leadership team that I'm on? And then I just listened. And within, I mean, within a few moments, I sensed him whispering to my heart. This was the thought that I had pretty clearly. Alan, you have abdicated your leadership on this team. I want you to step up and lead. So I said, okay, I have direction. And I just, I sensed what he was saying. I said yes to what he sensed he was saying to me. And then I texted the other team members and two of them responded almost immediately by saying, we've known this for months. We were just waiting for you to actually ask, you know, God about it. But that was a powerful lesson for me. I had spent so much time carrying the weight of that decision. I was carrying the weight of the decision, but I never once asked Jesus what he wanted me to do. That was, a little, that was a big lesson for me. And I'm just telling you, since saying yes to that decision a year ago, whenever it happened, man, I've, been, I've, I've seen the positive impact of that choice. Now, in this area of guidance, let me just mention one little caveat here. When we are making decisions based on what we think we're hearing God say to us, it is really wise to bring others in the, to the process. Like in my example, that leadership decision, I bounced what I thought I was hearing, I bounced it off the rest of the team members and they confirmed it. And this is especially true with bigger decisions like a new job or getting married. It's really important to, to include trusted counsel. So to, to share with a few other trusted people in your life, hey, this is kind of what I'm sensing. What, this is what I'm hearing and bounce it off them. And, and here's the deal. We, we, the, the reality is we have, a, we have a, a much harder time hearing from God on a directional guidance related question when we are secretly hoping for a particular answer, right? Can we acknowledge that kind of gets a little convoluted? It gets a little more difficult to hear. So in those kinds of situations, when you secretly want something, it's really wise to confirm what you're sensing him say to you. Just confirm it through the counsel of some other people that you trust. Now, one other area in which I think it is so helpful to ask Jesus questions is related to what we talked about in week one, experiencing God's delight in us, right? That was a foundation of, of this whole journey. And in, in any love relationship, think about this, in any love relationship, we want and need to hear the other person tell us that they love us, tell us what they think about us. We need that. Well, how much more is that true in our relationship with God? As, as we saw in week one, a crucial part of the Spirit's job description is that it te- the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's child, that we are God's children. So to testify means to speak, right? It means to speak. The spirit wants to whisper to our inner being how fully loved we are by God. And so asking the Lord love-related questions, I know this feels a little weird, but why not? Asking the Lord love-related questions provides a great way to hear that afresh. So what if the next time you practice stillness, you ask the Lord, Jesus, what do you like about me? And then you just listen to his response. Write down whatever thoughts come to your mind. And if you're thinking, I could never ask the Lord that, that's, there's another question to ask. Why is it so hard for me to even ask the Lord this question? Is it, I don't even believe he likes me? I don't even believe he likes anything about me. See, there's a lot here when we begin asking the Lord questions and then listen to his response. Ask him, Jesus, what do you like about me? And then listen to his response and write down whatever you're hearing. What you're doing is you're giving the spirit room to whisper to your soul the truth of how much he delights in you. And look, sometimes, just speaking from personal experience, sometimes we need to hear this whisper in a place of wounding or pain. I remember an experience a few years ago where as I was practicing stillness, I became aware of this tender place in my heart, um, this kind of this tender place in my heart where someone in the past had 
hurt me. And it felt very raw in that moment. As I was in stillness, I wasn't even thinking about it. Then it kind of came to mind. It just felt very raw, remembering this kind of this memory. And I realized that what had happened in that place of wounding, my heart subconsciously concluded that I wasn't really worth loving. And so I had begun to believe a lie that I had to succeed in order for people to value me. And so I'm in this place of stillness, tears start coming to my eyes. I'm just kind of tuning into that part. Tears start coming to my eyes from this, this, this wound. And in that place, I renounced the lie I believed. I realized it was a lie. I renounced this lie I believed. And then I asked Jesus this question, what's the truth that you want me to know? And, and this is a portion of what I heard from him. I wrote it in my journal. Alan, I see you. Your heart matters to me. I love you for who you are and not just for what you can do. I love you for being my son. I am so proud of you. See, that was just what my heart needed to hear. But without the practice of stillness, I would have just kept going on with life, not paying attention to this vulnerable place, this wound in my heart that was impacting me, it was impacting me as an adult. So in stillness, we have this beautiful opportunity to listen to Jesus speak, his love to the deepest places uh, and these parts, the deepest parts of ourselves. So as we continue our journey of intimacy with Jesus in the coming weeks, we're going to see how our ability to hear the voice of Jesus can have a significant impact on our experience of prayer in our experience of of scripture. And we're gonna talk about these things in the next few weeks. But for now, for this week, I simply want you to practice listening to Jesus in your times of stillness, allowing your intimacy with him to deepen. So the three exercises that you're gonna do this week are gonna give you opportunity to do this with Jesus, just kind of a guided way. Now, before we conclude this week's content, I do want to address a common concern. Um, How do we know if what we're hearing is from God? That makes people really nervous. How do I know this is from God? What if it's, you know, whatever. What if it's myself or whatever, whatever. How do we do that? And then before trying to answer that question, it's a legitimate question, but before we try to answer that legitimate question, I want to remind us of something really, really important. We are talking about a love relationship. We're talking about a love relationship. Jesus, our good shepherd, wants to help us learn how to hear him, okay? This is a journey. If we happen to hear incorrectly, so what? He is eager to guide us back to the path he has for us, right? This is a journey. If we, we maybe didn't hear correctly and we wander over, well, then he can guide us back, So I just want to right-size what we're talking about. We don't have to feel this pressure. Oh, we got to know for sure this is from God. Let's let our shepherd lead us. Let's journey with him. Let's let's tune into his whisper and let him lead us knowing that he loves us and he's able to help us recognize how to hear his voice. And just like sheep, if we wander a little bit, what's the shepherd do? Oh, oops, come back, right? That's the relationship Jesus says we have with him. He's our shepherd. We're his sheep. Okay, so when we think that we're hearing something that we think is from God, we can use some simple discernment tools to help help us determine whether or not this is from God. So there are four discernment tests that I have found helpful. Number one is what I call the scripture test. And this is just, does what I'm hearing violate any principle in the Bible? Does what I'm hearing violate any principle in the Bible? Second is what I call the tone test. Does what I'm hearing feel forceful or condemning? You know, is the tone of it, does it feel shaming? Does it it feel condemning? Is this consistent with what I know of Jesus' character? There have been times in stillness when what initially pops into my head sounds and feels pretty condemning. It, it feels pretty, you know, it just kind of feels accusatory and it just stirs shame or fear. And, and it's okay just to say, I don't think this is from the Lord. Now, let me be really clear. Jesus can say hard things to us. I mean, I feel like that kind of a little bit of a rebuke. You've abdicated your leadership, Alan. That was kind of a, that was a gentle rebuke, but it didn't feel condemning. 
He was saying something hard to me, but it wasn't condemning. It didn't produce anxiety or condemnation. So pay attention to the the tone of what you're hearing. The third test is the resonance test. Does this resonate? Does what I'm hearing resonate with my heart? Um, Does it feel true? Does it resonate with people who know me well? Those are great questions. I was with a friend very recently who had just received an email from someone. And in the email, they shared about what they were sensing in their spirit about him. And, and, he, and he read it and he said, I don't, I don't think, that, I don't think that's, that's right. That doesn't resonate with me at all. I just don't think that's true. That doesn't resonate with my heart at all. And he just didn't bother him. He just kind of went on. See, that's discernment, right? That's discernment. Does this resonate with me? And then finally, the fruit test. Does this, what I'm sensing, does it over time bear fruit? I think the example where just to step into that place of leadership and I'm seeing the fruit of that. So that's how we can learn over time. You know, we can look at the fruit of what we're hearing and we can use that as a discernment tool. So as we're engaging in the practice of stillness, being attentive to the voice of Jesus, let's keep these four guardrails in mind, okay? Keep them in mind. But again, remember, you have a Savior who loves you and who longs to help you hear his voice. That's the truth. He loves you and he longs to help you hear his voice. So let's expectantly create space for stillness, and cultivate a heart posture of listening to his whisper. I'm telling you, your relationship with Jesus will never be the same. It's like opening up a whole new dimension in your relationship with Jesus. For me, I mean, this is what it was for me. A one-sided, you know, sometimes our relationship with Jesus is just us talking all the time. This opens up a whole new dimension to a relationship with Jesus and is so vital in our growing, in our experience of intimacy with Jesus. Amen. All right, why don't we stand? So perfect response to this message. We're gonna, we're gonna just quiet our hearts and we're gonna see if Jesus wants to say anything to us. So we're, um, we're, we're going to do this. Uh, I'm going I'm to just in a moment, it's going to pray, come Holy Spirit. I invite you just to listen, to see if Jesus is saying anything to you. And then the worship team, we're going to create space just for that kind of listening to his voice. And then after a, a couple songs, I'm going to come back up and then I'm going to lead us in, um, to the table to receive the Lord's Supper tonight. But we're going to start here with just a few minutes of, of stillness. So let's quiet our hearts. So Holy Spirit, come. We open our hearts and our minds to you. And we invite you to speak to us, to speak to us. All right, so if something here has inspired you or captivated you or challenged you, I think this overall topic has a lot of paths that you are able to go down, especially um, talking about this book that Pastor Allen has done. Uh, to find different content about that, go to alancraft.com, or you can go to our, our site to explore the different podcasts and and content that's out there. There also is a chat. So if, if you're interested in talking about the things that you're experiencing or growing further in that, go on that chat. There's someone there who will be behind that and very eager to talk. So with that being said, thank you for being here. It's great, and I will see you soon.